I am going to start with an apology, which is that um, I'm not having uh, a deal with um, uh, after you know, about 50 years, well, 30 years at least later, that it should have uh, done uh, King's College of London to the Women's Department. Um, but she's currently in Berlin at the Max Planck Bank interview and she's stepping in to the Max so it's in that capacity, I suppose, that um, I'm uh, chairing a session about what historians can do about um, gender equality. And we have two um, incredibly distinguished um, panelists in the next few minutes. Um, um, speaking second will be uh, Professor Lindsay Roper, Ro Ro a fellow media professor, professor of history at Royal College University of Oxford, Oxford. And speaking first will be um, Professor Peter Mandler. Professor of Modern Cultural History at the University of Cambridge. So I'll hand over to you. Well, I, I found this an incredibly searching um, and sometimes very moving discussion uh, all day. And um, uh, it's really hard to know what to say after it all. I mean, I do want to say one or two things about things that have happened during the day, even though that's not our brief. Um, uh, one thing I, I particularly wanted to say is just to put in a pitch for um, the wide range of uh, London women historians who do not teach in the University of London. And I'm, I'm, I, I say that for two reasons. One is a kind of familial piety. Um, my mother-in-law, still um, thriving at 90, and I do recommend if anyone wants to follow up this suggestion I'm about to drop and do some moral history, um, catch her. Um, now at 90, um, she's out of right in her prime. But my mother-in-law, um, who graduated from UCL in English in 1948, then went as her first job to admin to work as an administrator and a teacher uh, at Hillcroft College um, in Surrey, um, which is uh, was then and is now uh, the only uh, all-woman uh, residential higher education college in uh, the United Kingdom. Um, uh, and which was planned with open in 1920 as a Ruskin College for Women, which hardly, which hardly ever gets mentioned in any discussion of women in higher education, uh, because of course they taught mostly sub degree level work. Um, and she then passed on her job to her sister in law, my aunt in law, who taught art history there until relatively recently. So we have about 60 or almost 70 years of, uh, of track record. In, Teaching in Hillcroft, and there are there were historians and art historians there who counted in their number. And uh, when I started teaching in the UK system, I um, taught at what was then City of London Polytechnic, and um, uh, then became London Guildhall University, um, um, uh, now in advantage of existence. And it will be known to many of you here as the home of the Women's Library, um, briefly, or not briefly, for quite a long time, but no longer. <laughs> Um, under circumstances that I, I don't want to uh, put it on. Um, and, but um, we launched a, an MA in, in modern British women's history, which was a, a kind of a follow on from the famous MA that's been mentioned right several times today, Lindell, uh, <laughs> uh, founded by Lindell and Vickery. Uh, and and, Vickery. Um, and, um, and where, of course, the Women's Library was, you know, in a, not only an important part of the intellectual life, but probably the only part of the intellectual life of that institution sometimes. Um, um, and an institution which had almost accidentally acquired this important feminist resource because the librarian was um, Rita Pankhurst, the um, daughter-in-law of Sylvia, um, and a wife of uh, Richard, who just died a few weeks ago, um, and who brought that incredible resource to the city of London Polytechnic at a time when it had very few so anyway, uh, there are there are many London women historians who haven't yet had a look in. There's plenty much more to, to say and write about. Um, so um, as far as um, some of the way forward goes, I mean, again, I'm not really in the best position to um, talk about this. Um, and so many really useful things have already been said. But I, I'll just make a few general points uh, with some specific um, consequences. And I think I was thinking just at the very end, listening to that very interesting discussion between Margot and Susan Peterson from the floor, and then earlier the discussion about um, between between the economic historians about why women do or do not go into economic history and what can be done about it. 
one of the things that united all those um, discussions for me was um, something that wasn't really very frequently um, acknowledged explicitly, but was implicit throughout much of our discussion today, which is we live in a very unequal society, and it's not getting more equal in many respects. Um, and that we have to be a little careful when we are struggling for equality in an area of gender where, in fact, significant strides have been made. We have to be a little bit careful not to ignore those other uh, dimensions of inequality, and, and also actually the, the, the effects they may have in having to uh, be having a disguising and continued gender inequality and I may sound to be may sound like I'm saying something slightly similar to what Margot said but actually I think I'm saying something different and it's one of those extremely rare circumstances where Mark and I are going to disagree but that much about something so uh, everyone uh, uh, but he's wrong <laughs> <laughs> this, but I came last so shut up <laughs> uh, no Margot was right in, in 98 percent of uh, everything but the, you know, this is a 2% uh, issue where we can uh, agree to disagree. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I do think that we, we have to acknowledge the way in which inequalities um, must uh, shape the strategies that we adopt in order to strive for gender equality. Um, one of the things that we've been kind of dodging around, it came up once or twice, but not really very centrally, was the way in which market mechanisms are being implanted deeper and deeper into the heart of the um, higher education system. And actually, this is one of the places where I agree with Mark, one of the vast majority of places where I agree, and that I do think that procedures are important precisely because they demystify and sometimes maybe even neutralize um, the effects of those market inequalities. The problem is that the market mechanisms are, are highly mystified. And they're black boxes. They're not supposed to look into them because they're supposed to be self-acting, um, and they, they work principally on the basis of merit. Um, and as we all know, especially in this age of, of the return of grammar schools, merit is a highly political category. Um, one of the things that I found very distressing in being involved in the Athena Swan process is how um, pay is really completely off the table, at least as it's presented been presented to us by our HR department. Um, and, yet, and, I, and I think it's precisely because it is a black box and because pay, um, what in my institution is called market pay, that is the pay that's not um, closely monitored by procedures, the one that's not, the, the level of pay that's not subject to the usual promotion and increment procedures, that is the, the, the bit that the really rich people get at the really top, at the top that is completely off the um, of the um, agenda, and yet if that is, of course, a way in which gender inequality is going to come back into the system unobserved by procedures, because the beneficiaries of the market supplements, at least in my institution, are very largely men. Partly because of the subjects they're in, um, and partly because they're asking, and partly for the, the very good reason that someone mentioned earlier today, that they consider themselves more mobile, so they're able to go out and, and, and get those outside offers which get them um, someone also mentioned in the course of the discussion, um, again, I think a really good point, the, the way in which uh, actually sabbatical entitlement is not um, uh, uh, available by right in those institutions any longer. I think we should be pressing for that. It's one of those procedures that we should be um, uh, defending because it is completely, it, it is and can be completely transparent. But in, in most institutions now, it's a competitive process because entitlements are seen to be feather bedding and giving people, again, things that they don't merit. Um, and the, but the competitive processes is which, to which people are submitting themselves in order to get there, those research, that research leave, um, um, is also highly mystified, very opaque, black box, you know, it's supposed to be, it's a merit decision, so it's got to be made by someone who's responsible for making decisions on merit, it can't be subject to procedures, um, and again, I, I suspect, it would be harder to document this, that men disproportionately benefit from that. If we look at the problem that the RHS gender report revealed, in which, again, everyone acknowledges, and it's been well discussed in this room, that, that one of the principal um, um, gender issues right now in history departments is, um, uh, is, the, uh, is women's failure to uh, break through into the, the professoriat. Um, surely, it is women's um, 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 inadequate endowment with um, research leave entitlement that is um, um, playing a role. Um, I'm probably a major role um, in, 
that breakdown of a, of a genuinely meritocratic or genuinely equal, um, equal opportunity promotion system. So those are just some examples where marketization is actually um, undermining our best efforts to, um, to achieve gender equality. Um, and, and this is where the, the, the little point I'm sure I'm going to disagree with, Mar with Margo. I mean, I wouldn't, um, nothing I, I say I would, would I want to be um, interpreted as any way um, uh, uh, disparaging efforts to make the historical profession available to everyone on an equal basis. Um, uh, and I'm involved in three separate initiatives right now um, to make the history profession more attractive to um, students um, from uh, ethnic minorities. But the reasons why ethnic minorities are underrepresented in history are not largely within um, our, um, our purchase, our influence. Um, decisions are being made by um, young ethnic minority um, people before they get to university, and they're being made again for reasons that acknowledge the inequalities in this society and which make a lot of sense to them, and which I personally would find it very difficult um, to respond to by saying, oh, you should become a historian or a philosopher instead. Um, um, ethnic minority um, um, pupils are choosing um, what, what they see as, as subjects that are more likely to yield them high incomes as early as GCSE and A level. And by the time they come to degree level, um, their representation in, um, in history programs is very low indeed. I mean, very, very low. Now, of course, it, it could be higher. Um, I mean, it's the lowest uh, ethnic minority subject um, at undergraduate <coughs> level apart from veterinary and agriculture. And that, so that's really saying something quite, quite striking. So of course it should be higher, but you know, law, medicine, and business are the highest, have the highest ethnic minority representation. And actually, ethnic minorities are overrepresented in those subjects. That is, they're doing extremely well in those subjects. And, and for the reasons that I've just suggested, that, that parents and labor markets and all the advice they're getting and all the signals they're getting from the wider society is this is the, the way to ensure that the inequalities that you suffer from the day you're born as a, as a ethnic minority citizen of this country, those inequalities are going to be most directly and best addressed um, by instrumentally choosing subjects at the university, which will bring you higher incomes. Now, in fact, some of, those, some of that advice, and some of those signals that they're getting are incorrect because uh, many of them aim for medical degrees. They don't get into medical programs. They get instead into programs in what are <coughs> subjects allied to medicine, uh, <coughs> pharmacy, uh, radiology, those kinds of things, and actually those don't pay the big salaries that they're aiming for. So, you know, we could uh, we could have an interesting debate about um, how best to advise 14-year-old um, Asian or or Afro-Caribbean um, pupils. But the reason they're not represented in history, as I say, has to do with uh, not entirely, but largely to do with those factors that are, are outside of our direct control. And what we should be doing is drawing attention to the wider inequality society that don't put them in that position in the first place. But that does draw our attention again back to gender inequality, because um, it is the case that all the most significant um, gender inequalities in our profession, and here I'm just speaking about academia, um, uh, in, in history, um, all the most uh, the, the most grievous gender inequalities, they happen while um, the, the students and our colleagues are amongst us, uh, under, under our control. The RHS gender report showed that um, the undergraduate distribution in history is pretty much 50-50 now. Um, the postgraduate uh, um, distribution in history between men and women in, is just about 50-50. There's leakage um, between postgraduate and academic staff, so that 60% of academic staff in history are men and 40% are women. And then there's this um, uh, chasm that opens up between um, the bottom ranks of the academic staff and the professoriate, where we're still in this position that 80% are men and 20% are women. This is the, situation is not improving. Um, this is something wholly within our control. Um, and uh, it's why I think we're right to um, have events like this, not just uh, commemorating women historians, but thinking practically about um, how to promote women in the profession, which they ought to have an equal share in, simply by uh, 
dint of their representation in the student cohort. Um, and I think this is why we're right to turn ourselves at the end to practical steps. Um, I've already suggested what some of those practical steps are. There have been many more <coughs> suggestions in the course of the day, and it's presumptuous, and we can try to improve on that living is going to um, uh, do better uh, in any case in, in two minutes. Um, I'll just say one or two things, though, about practical steps that perhaps haven't been um, said so far. One is I'm a little bit more skeptical than Alana was about Athena Swan. And I suspect that's because Alana and her team at Kings have had a better, uh, maybe had a better support. They certainly had a better experience with the process than I have had uh, at Cambridge. And it's not been my colleagues at Cambridge who have been uh, causing difficulties. It has been, frankly, uh, the HR department. And it's perfectly clear to me that not just in my institution, but in some other institutions, and I won't name them, but when I was president of the World Historical Society years ago, um, I, uh, um, that's a joke, mm. uh, <laughs> sorry Marco, um, uh, you know, uh, we were exposed to a number of cases of, of institutions which were not properly, were not taking the Venus one uh, process seriously. You know, there, there are a lot of colleagues who have gone through this process who have not been very happy with the outcomes. And there are some dangers that can turn into a box ticking exercise. And if you let the HR department make it into a propaganda exercise, which is especially easy at the bronze level, where all you have to do is have good intentions, you don't have to, to demonstrate that you're doing anything yet. Then, you, then it runs the risk of being the thing into which all the gender complaints get pushed. And um, the real issues, which, as we have amply demonstrated today, are cultural and political as much as procedural, or as well as procedural, um, all of those issues will get um, deep, hard cultural and political issues will be, will get pushed away into some uh, cosmetic exercise. And anyone who works at a UK higher education institution knows how easy it is nowadays for a administrative department to seize control of an academic process and to render it null. Um, so, and do I have two minutes? You do. Um, so I do think that there are two things um, that I, I have a feeling that uh, Lyndall and I were checking each other out just before this session. I have a feeling that Lyndall is going to say a lot more about this, so I will just uh, just use my last 90 seconds to, to indicate. Um, I do think we have to be savvy about, uh, and again, some of this has to do with political and cultural forces that we don't have total control over, but we have to be savvy about um, the way in which our discipline has already been constructed over generations in very conventional ways, which even the most radical of us are still locked within. And we have to be careful in making decisions about hiring, especially, not to be just reproducing our past procedures because they are the accumulated wisdom of the, of the profession. Um, um, because we, if we do that, we might be reproducing gender inequalities that are almost invisible to us. There's been an interesting discussion about military history and economic history, and I, and I mentioned parliamentary history earlier. There are subjects which are dominated by men. And obviously, we want them to be less dominated by men. But in the, in the meantime, they are dominated by men. If you advertise posts in those um, sub-disciplines, you will get a, a, a largely male um, um, uh, uh, applicant pool. And that will be shaping your decisions about the future of the profession. So I do strongly advocate widening the, the scope of jobs to include as wide a, 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 a possible, I mean, obviously you have to cover a bunch of teaching um, and research goals, but to widen the scope of jobs um, to um, to keep as wide a, a possible pool um, um, available to you um, from which to choose. Um, and and to be constantly thinking about where is the profession going to be in 12, 10, 20, 30 years when those people you're hiring are you know rising up the ladder. Um, and if you try to do that, if you try to do a little fortune telling, which historians are notoriously bad at doing, um, <laughs> you're, you're going to be um, avoiding the pitfalls of simply reproducing power relationships in the existing discipline and hopefully creating circumstances into which our younger siblings and uh, children um, might thrive in an in a, in a, in a, in a environment which does have 50% of the professors in our Thank you. Um, I'm going to stand up, um, if that's okay. Um, I'm I have to start with an apology, if I'm allowed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry I was not able to be here today. Um, I can't tell you how sorry I am. Um, I would have loved to be here. So it may be that my remarks will be completely beside the point. But I also feel 
very emotional about being here. This is where I started out doing intellectual work in this country. Um, and many of the people who taught me and who shaped what I do are in this room. And some of the people who have died are commemorated in this display. And that really means a lot to me. So what needs doing now? Um, I'm going to give you my shopping list. Then I'm going to talk about a couple of areas where I think there are real problems that we face. And then finally, I want to pick up on what Peter talked about, about history itself. So what needs doing now? Well, the Royal Historical Society survey has been incredibly useful, and I'm really pleased that that happened. And I think what, there are many things that um, it's helped in moving forward and making one think about because it's something to which you can refer and when you say well the Royal Historical Society said then it's much easier to get things to change and that has been absolutely my experience it's been quite extraordinary and many of my male colleagues have said but what about the Royal Historical Society um, study I think one of the things that that clearly throws up and that we all have to think about is again something Peter talked about, the idea of excellence and how we um, appoint people. And of course, as we all know, the idea of excellence is that it's someone who's like you. <laughs> and that is, of course, why ethnic diversity is going to be much, much more difficult. And it is something that we really have to fight and think about and move to changing this profession. We also just need to think about maybe simple demands, like just having it a matter of course that on every shortlist there should be a woman on it, and if there's not, there should be an explanation, and that should just be a matter of course. The Royal Historical Society also made me think about the areas in which you advertise. It's obvious, but it's really important, and it does make a real difference. And we have to think about promotion, women chairs, or at the moment I think 21%, or is it 20%? In Germany, just by contrast, it's 33%. And when you think that we started from a base where it was the other way around, where Germany had, I think, two women professors, and I knew to vote, <laughs> <laughs> to move from that in a generation is really quite phenomenal. We've done nothing like that. We have to think about part-time working and flexibility. Again, there is no reason why part-time working and flexibility should not be possible in this profession. Just about every other profession has managed to do that, and if we can't, I don't understand why. We need things like seminar-friendly times, um, family-friendly times, or carer-friendly times, because without that, you exclude a whole lot of people with caring um, responsibilities from a share in intellectual life, and it's just not okay. And another very interesting thing that came out of the Royal Historical Society study was that you can have a member on every faculty committee who's tasked with watching out for diversity issues, and that is such a great and very simple suggestion. It's very anodyne, it's very easy to get it through, or so I've found, and then it suddenly means that you're not responsible for it. You have an ally. There's someone whose job it is to watch out for that, and it doesn't all fall to you. And I think that's very important because one of the things that can happen with all of this is that women get burned out because there's just too much to do, and it's too stressful, and it takes too many hours. And Athena Swan also makes a big difference, um, whatever its problem, because it forces people to confront the issue. And above all, events like this make an absolutely massive difference. It makes you realize that you're not on your own. A couple of things that are really concerning me at the moment, um, and one of those is the proposals for the next rep. And here, I think we really need to make our voices heard. And this is an issue where I can't work out what the answer is, because uh, I'm not very good at thinking of creative solutions, but maybe you can. What is making me really worried at the moment is that the new proposals seem to propose a blanket number of outputs per department, and that is based on the number of staff. 
And then that is not linked to each person having to produce a certain number of outputs because a certain minority of them will be then selected or however it works out. But what does that mean for maternity leave? It seems to me that this document provides no maternity leave protection because there isn't a reduction of how many outputs you're meant to make. And in fact, the pressure, I think, will be on women to produce as much as they can of the highest quality, regardless of whether they've had maternity leave or not. And I'm very worried about that because it's very insidious, because it's part of, it will be part of one of the things that you have to do to get promotion. And I, I think we have to work out a way of incorporating maternity leave yet again into rent proposals. And of course, that's exactly what we had to do last time. And I'm getting a little sick of this. <laughs> I think the other thing that's worrying me perhaps even more is the teaching excellence framework, but not so much that as developments that I see happening in relation to early career researchers. It seems to me that in a number of departments, as um, I try and find out what's going on, there seems to be a general expectation that you need about 8 to 12 student contact hours a week for it to be an acceptable provision of teaching. Just about every department cannot do that with its own resources. So what do they do? They create teaching fellowships for early career researchers. Great, you might think. Except that what I find in many places is that the hours that a teaching uh, fellow is meant to work are very, very high. Some departments are doing what they can to uh, protect research time, but I did come across one department where I spoke to one young man who said that he um, and his partner were thinking about what to do, and she was going to take the teaching track, and he was going to take the research track. And it seems to me that is exactly what is starting to happen, because the teaching hours are so excessive, and people are thinking about how can they make a life that is <coughs> worth living, where it's not just killing <coughs> yourself all the time uh, to, to get the next publication, and I'm worried that women will feel pushed into going down the teaching track, as it's known. And I think that we have to really watch out for that and the kind of exploitation that is often involved for early career um, uh, people. What worries me is that unless you're very, very careful, gender issues so often go backwards. So, there are issues that you constantly have to fight. You can never um, stop watching out uh, for them. But I think the way to do that, as Trish Crawford would have said if she'd been here, is for women to work together, for women to be able to support one another and to gain strength from one another, and to insist on having a work-life balance. It isn't just about success. It's about having a life in which you can be both a woman, who you are, or a man, and live that life where relationships with people are really important and where you're not sacrificing all of that to some kind of idea about work. What makes it hard for us to work together? Well, I really think we do need to support one another more. I think we also have to recognize that women do all sorts of different kinds of history. Many do religious, intellectual history, history of war, and they feel that they don't want to be forced to do gender history or to identify um, as women. But I think that is absolutely true, and yet I think that part of what I would hope we want to achieve is a different way of understanding history itself. And I would hope that it's about getting all kinds of history taken seriously and that we have to not be territorial. I get very upset when people talk about our history and I know they mean that a lot of people are not included in that hour and I think we need to challenge that. 
And I think that gender history, and the history of women, has to be intellectually alive, and it has to change. And I think one of the really exciting things is that young women now are starting to think about inequality. And they're starting to ask questions about that and to ask about them in relation to history. And I think that's what many people are interested in now. They're interested in forms and structures of inequality. And I think we have to think too about global and transnational history, which seems to be sweeping all before it. And quite rightly so, it gets us away from the nation state. And it can open up new ways of thinking about history, whose history it is that we're <coughs> And for that, we will need people with lots of language, languages. But we also need to think about people in global and transnational history. We need to be able to take that agenda and show what it means for women and what it means for gender history. And if I think about Trish Crawford's work, um, her work, the article of hers that I love most is the one on menstruation, which came out in, I think, 1981. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's hard to recall now what a shock it was <laughs> that there should have been an article in past and present on menstruation. What Trish did was that she drew <coughs> from her experience, from her experience as a woman, and she wasn't afraid to write an article that didn't fall into the categories of what people thought that history was. And all of these women who we're celebrating are outliers in that way. And I would hope that together we can think about writing a history in which people are always unpacked and where we're thinking about men, women, people who are transgender, people who have a whole mass of different identities, and where what we can think about is people as agents, people as active and involved in history, and where we can critically examine the fundamentals of what we're writing about so that it's no longer about boys' stories, but it's a question to do with existence and embodiment itself. Thank you.